So this is the week of the 2018 Major League Baseball All-Star break here in the United States. I'm a big baseball fan. I don't really care much about the World Cup, which is also going on at this time. But baseball is my favorite sport. I'm a big Cubs fan. Uh, one of the sites I really like watching uh, to keep track of my favorite team and other teams throughout the season is 538. They post uh, predictions about uh, who's going to win each game, who's going to make it to the playoffs, who's going to get to the World Series, who's going to win that. And I've always wondered, how accurate are those predictions? Uh, they never show any validation data to show that the results are right. A couple years ago when the Cubs won the World Series, I think at one point, 538, after maybe game two or three, had the Cubs as 7% uh, chance of winning the World Series. Of course, they went on to win the World Series. And so we don't really know how accurate that model was necessarily. In many ways, this is analogous to the 2016 political uh, predictions that they made, where I think they gave Hillary Clinton a 70, maybe 80% chance of winning, and of course Donald Trump won. So we don't know, was the model right or wrong, right? So 80% of the time, that means 20% of the time Trump could have won. We can't play the election over again in the multiverse with a thousand different repl replications of that election. <laughs> Thank goodness that'd be pretty painful to know if in those thousand different universes, um, if Trump would have won 20, 30, whatever percent of the time to validate the model. Well, with baseball and sports, we can do that. A uh, typical baseball team plays 162 games a year. There's 30 different baseball teams. So there's a large number of games being played over the course of a season. My thought, uh, and what I want to explore with you during this week's of, week of tutorials, is to see, can we take a prediction? And so if 538 says the Cubs have a 56% chance of beating the Cardinals, well, if they play a couple dozen games over the course of a season with that 56% uh, percent probability of winning, how many times do they actually win? Is it 56? Is it 40? Is it 80? And then what do we think of that? Okay. And there's some other ways of modeling it. 538 uses a model called ELO, which is largely based on a rating system that was developed for chess, where you compare two uh, players going up against each other. They've adapted it um, for baseball. Their model has a lot of other things, like besides just win-losses, to include things like how far the visiting team has had to travel, um, how much rest they've gotten, um, who's pitching, who has home field advantage, uh, those types of factors. So the model gets a little bit more complicated than just looking at the wins losses of each team. So there is also a model, of course, based on wins and losses that we'll look at later in the week. And another model that is out there that we don't typically think of as a model is the betting line. And so if, if the bookmakers tell us that Cubs are a, you know, a, a favorite over the Cardinals, well, how often is that right? How often, and those, those lines, the betting lines that are made, are made by people that are betting on the game. And so perhaps there's some wisdom in the crowd in assessing who's going to win the game. And so my question is, if I want to know who's going to win a game or have a good sense of who's going to win a game, um, what model should I follow? And, and we could maybe put some money on this and say, um, say I'm going to put 100 bucks on the favorite for each game. Which modeling system should I use and how much money would I make by the end of the season? Okay. And so through this, I want to answer these questions, but I also want to explore with you various tools that we have for doing data analysis and making that data analysis reproducible. Because I want you to look at what I've done and go forward and say, well, well, Pat looked at these models, I have found a fourth model. Or Pat made some assumptions um, that I don't quite like. Or Pat did this with baseball. I'd like to repeat it with NBA statistics. And so the idea being that you can use my methods, my approaches to build upon or to revise and perhaps explore these questions further or to go on a tangent and look at different questions as well. So I hope you stick with me over the next few tutorials as we explore these questions and have a little bit of fun during the All-Star break. Go ahead and navigate over to the 538 website at 538.com. And if you've never been to the 538 website, one of the things that really sticks out to me is that they do a lot of great journalism that's built around data. Uh, as you see their uh, titles across the top here of their banner, you see they do everything from politics, sports, science and health, economics and culture. Um, they have articles on you know the eight different types of rock movies <laughs> um, or um, things in science and health related to, um, they did one on um, uh, gut health, 
um, and other types of health, um, economics, sports, politics. I think politics and sports are where um, most of their strengths lie. Um, again, they do things like aggregating different polls. 538 comes from uh, Nate Silver's ability in, I think, the 2012 or 2008 election to accurately predict all 538 electoral votes. Um, and so they do a lot of great analysis that's really shaped by and shaped around data. If we go to the sports tab, um, as I said before, like the, the, one of the great things about sports is that there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of iterations. There's a lot of, of, of the same game, so to speak, right? So um, like in baseball, uh, the Cubs, after the All-Star break, are going to play the Cardinals five times in four days. So we basically get to see the same team play five times in a very concise period of time. Um, and this, similar types of things in uh, soccer, the World Cup, which just ended, um, tennis, uh, lots of other uh, stories that they cover that, again, are all built around um, statistics and data analysis of those sports. And so the one we're concerned about this week during the All-Star break um, are the MLB predictions. So if you go ahead and click on more MLB predictions, this brings you to their table of uh, their ratings, their rankings of the different teams in Major League Baseball based on their ELO rating. And so that's this column here. So you see my beloved Cubs um, are in here at first place in the NL Central, the ELO rating of 1568, and they trail the Astros um, by about 30 points. I don't really have a good sense of what that means, but um, I think they're, they're pretty far away from the Astros. Um, the Cubs, as I'll show you here, have, have been pretty consistent in their ELO rating over the course of the season. One of the things they do with this ELO rating, then, is to simulate future games. Um, the Cubs so far have um, 155 and lost 38, so that's about 92 games. Uh, there's 162 games total in the season, so, um, what was that, 80, 93? There's like, I don't know, um, 70, 69 games left in the season. And so they're simulating the rest of those to say that the Cubs will probably win about 42 more games to get to 97 wins, which is, I think, a spectacular season. They then estimate, based on those simulations, the probability that the Cubs will make the postseason, uh, win their division, and then go on to win the World Series. So things are looking pretty good right now as a Cubs fan. Uh, the American League certainly looks pretty strong. Uh, the Cubs, at least by the ELO ratings and also by the win-loss percentages, are doing um, the best in the National League. Up until the last weekend before the All-Star break, the Brewers actually had a better record um, than the Cubs. Um, but consistently the Cubs had had a higher ELO rating than the Brewers over the course of the season. And so if you believe the ELO rating or the predictions from the 538 website, you'd think, wow, this really had baked into it knowing that the Cubs were a better team than the Brewers, even though the record indicated uh, that the opposite was true. And perhaps what's going on is that it's taking into account things like who each of the teams has played and that perhaps in the first half of the season, the Cubs had a harder, harder uh, schedule than the Brewers did. So we can click on the link for Cubs, and we'll see, you know, basic summary statistics about their chance of making the playoffs, the standings, um, as well as the upcoming games. And so we know that Kyle Hendricks, the professor, uh, as he's nicknamed, uh, is slated to be the first pitcher uh, in the, the games back against the Cardinals. We don't know who the Cardinals are going to have pitching against the Cubs, but based on, um, you know, as of right now, when there's no games during the All-Star break, the Cubs have an ELO rating of 1568 to the Cardinals 1508. Uh, Kyle Hendricks gets us a, a bonus of seven points towards our ELO rating. The average generic Cardinals pitcher uh, has an ELO adjustment of one. Uh, the Cubs will be coming off this long all-star break with a lot of rest. It'll be a home game. Uh, so they get quite a bit of, of a bump in terms of um, a bonus towards their ELO rating. While, whereas the Cardinals have also had the rest, but they're traveling um, up the highway to, to Chicago uh, to play the games. And so at the end of all this, we have all these adjustments, and this then gives a chance of winning for the Cubs at 62% and the Cardinals 38%. And in fact, if you look across all of the games, um, and again, this is without knowing who the actual pitchers are, the Cubs have a pretty good chance to win 62% of these five games. So again, um, based on what we'd expect, over these five games, we'd expect the Cubs to win three of the five games. And, and, and of course, five is a small sample size, 
And so if we were to, say, flip a coin that was weighted uh, three-fifths to two-fifths, we might get a five-game sweep. The Cubs might lose all five games. But the question that I have is if we were to take all 62% probability games where the, the team is favored 62 to 38%, does the favorite team win 62% of the time? Okay, and so that's what we're going to tackle today as we go through in working with uh, these data from 538. You can see that the Cubs have been pretty consistent in their um, ELO rating over the course of the season, um, never really deviating or moving around too much. And then these are kind of the, the summaries of the uh, last games that the Cubs played. They finished the first half of the season uh, sweeping the Padres. Um, which is which is great to see. <laughs> um, one of the things I love about 538, beyond just their great reporting and their ability to bake data into everything they do, is that they really go out of their way to make a lot of their data and a lot of their code publicly accessible. And so you can read about the ELO ratings and how they've come up with these, but you can also, um, they have an article on the complete history of Major League Baseball, but the, you can also download the data. And so we're gonna click on that link and they will give us the data that goes into generating these ELO predictions. So I'm gonna click on info here. It was last updated two days ago, uh, so that would have been Sunday. Um, I'm a little bit behind in doing these, have had some technical difficulties and some craziness um, at home and other things, so uh, we're, doing, we're filming this on Tuesday of the All-Star break. And so this takes us to a, a GitHub page for the 538 website, um, and their directory, the repository that we're working in is called data. And in there, they have a directory called MLB ELO. Um, as I was getting ready to do these tutorials, um, I looked at the headings for their data table and noticed that a lot of them didn't make much sense. So I kind of went through and tried to annotate or give a definition to the column names. And uh, although it would have been nice for them to cite me <laughs> or thank me, uh, they, they took what I wrote and they put it right in here. But you can see we've got the date of the game, the year of the season, a neutral playoff, um, the home and away teams, and then also all the various ELO ratings, uh, the probabilities, um, and then the scores for those games. And so if we click on this link for the files, this will open up the CSV file that contains um, all of these data for every game that's been played in Major League Baseball. So a CSV is a comma separated variables file, and it's a quite large file. And so you'll see here the, the column headings here that we had defined in that readme file, as well as the data for each game, um, including games that haven't been played yet. Right? So we see that, um, again, the Cubs are playing the Cardinals five times this week. At the end of the season, they're gonna finish the season by playing the Cardinals as well. And so this is September 30th, 2018. Hasn't happened yet, but these are their predictions for what's going to happen. We can scroll to the end of the sheet to May 4th, 1871, uh, where I think it's Fort Wayne and Cleveland played each other. Um, and I believe Fort Wayne beat Cleveland two game two to zero. So again, baseball is very rich with data and there's a lot of great information in, um, that, that is just recorded by stat geeks and people that like to work with data. And so this is the file that we're going to be using as we go through our analysis. So as we get started, I want to keep everything under version control. So I'm gonna to go to github.com. If you don't already have a account set up, I'd really encourage you to pause the video and go create one now. And click on this plus sign to create a new repository. And I'm going to call this uh, baseball model analysis. I'm gonna call it baseball WL, win-loss model analysis. And so this is going to be um, 2018 All-Star Break demo demonstration analyzing 538 ELO model and other models for predicting winners of baseball games, MLB games. Great. I'm going to make it public. Uh, I could make it private, but then I'm going to have to pay extra for my account. If you have an academic account, which you can get through uh, GitHub's education features, you can then have private uh, repositories 
although I'm a professor at a university, I've never gotten around to making my own private account. Um, so I'm going to leave this as public. I'm really excited for other people to see it and to perhaps fork it and make suggestions and improve what we do as we go through here. I want to initialize the repository with a readme. I'm also going to add a git ignore file um, for R and I'm going to add an MIT license. And so this is a pretty permissive license and the git ignore file is going to be customized to those kind of nuisance, if you will, R files that I don't want to keep under version control um, and so I want git to be able to ignore those. So I'll go ahead and click create repository and this now creates my very simple repository. Before we go on, I'm going to create a new issue. So what I'd like to do is drive my analysis by going off of issues. And so the first issue is going to be analyze 538 ELO model performance. So issues can be used to keep track of bugs and to report bugs on other people's repositories or to keep track of bugs on your, your own. Um, the way it's set up is it, it can be a discussion. I also like to use it as a way to structure the analysis and to be kind of a checklist of the things that I need to work on as I go through my project. So the, the different things that I want to work on is I want to, uh, the other thing I'll add is that you can insert information into the text here using Markdown and this star space open close square bracket uh, will give you a checkbox and I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. So we need to download um, and format uh, the um, CSV data with uh, 538 um, history of MLD data. Uh, so I want to download it. I also want to make sure all the columns are in the right format and that everything looks good. I also want to um, ascertain who the favorite was for each game and whether the favorite won. Um, I also want to um, I want to see I want to see whether or not the what fraction of the time the favorite has won over the course of history of baseball. So I want to plot um, the fraction of games that the favorite has won over the history of baseball. I would also like to then know um, does the probability or do the probabilities generated by the ELO model um, actually bear out with real baseball data? So in other words, if it says the Cubs have a 62% chance of winning a game, if they play 100 games or they have a 62% chance of winning, do they win 62 of those 100 games or something close? And so if they do, uh, then, then that would tell us that the probability is actually meaningful. So again, I can click on this preview tab and I see that I get a checklist. I can then submit my new issue. I'm gonna, I can also add information. Sometimes I'll use these issues to keep track of different bits of data. So my raw data CSV file, uh, I'll put in a link for that. that um, and there's also a great Wikipedia page um, on ELO model ELO rating system uh, and so this is a great background set of information about the ELO model how it was developed for chess um, how it is modified uh, for working with chess and then also if you look down at the mathematical details it tells you how you can take the two ratings uh, and convert that to the probability then that player A would win or player B would win. So I'm going to copy this because that might be useful um, uh, later as we go through our analysis. Uh, so background and of course you could do you could input these links uh, as 
hyperlinks, right? So we could similarly do, um, we can make, you can make a hyperlink with Markdown doing this. Right. Um, for for these purposes, I like to have the naked URL out there just because uh, I might want to copy and paste uh, some of those links. Great. So this gives you a sense of how we might set up and structure our um, issues to be a, a to-do list as we go through our project. So the other thing we're going to do is we're going to work within um, our studio. Um, and I'm using our version 3.5, which came out in April. Um, I think it is the most recent version of R and R Studio. For the purposes of doing this demo, I'm going to modify my screen a bit so that um, the that I have my code up here in the upper left, and then I want to put my console and terminal up here in the upper right. So I'm going to go to R Studio Preferences, Pane Layout, and I'm going to make this then my console apply and voila it works great so next we're going to do a new r studio project where we can click on this link for create a project and i'm going to check out a project from a version control repository it's going to be git obviously and i want to get the url for this and so i'm going to clone or download, and I'm going to copy that into then um, my repository URL. And I'm going to call this baseball WL model analysis. And it's going to save it to my desktop, which I'm cool with. And I'm going to tell it to open in a new session. So we'll create that project. And it reopens it. And you can see now that in my local um, folder, I have the contents of that repository. Um, let me go ahead and open what that looks like over here just to prove to ourselves um, that I do in, have this, do in fact have this on my desktop, baseball WL model analysis. Um, you'll notice that we don't see the, w, the .getignore file that we have here. Uh, remember that the period indicates to, to um, the operating system that that should be a hidden file so we don't see that here and uh, it just it keeps things clean we can come up to our terminal and do ls and again we see the same things ls-a and we see the other hidden files like the rproj user dot get and the dot get ignore file um, i have my bash system set up so that it tells me what branch i'm in and red if there are commits that need to be made. I'm going to go ahead and expand this to be the full screen. And I'm going to then do git status. And it tells me that I've got this git ignore file and the rproj file that have been updated. I'll do git add dot git ignore. And then uh, baseball um, wlrproj file, git commit dash m set up our studio uh, uh, package or project excellent so I'm now going to create a new branch dash B and we'll call this um, 538 validation and so we now see that we're on the 538 branch, and we can also do get status. It says on branch 538 validation, nothing to commit, working tree clean. Excellent. So we're going to come back to our console, and I'm going to create a new R script. And I'm going to save this into my baseball WL model analysis directory as baseball model analysis. Maybe I'll just call it analysis.r. That, that works. And what I like to do across the top of my R scripts is to create um, a banner um, that 
is a bit of a preamble and tells me <laughs> uh, in the future uh, and you who are following along what's going on in this file. So at the top I might say file analysis.r author patch loss date uh, and it is July 17th 2018 and um, the purpose is this script um, runs the analysis to validate the 538 ELO model and other models for predicting who will win individual baseball games. Okay. So we can make this more fancy, include things like what are the dependencies, what are the requirements, um, those types of things. But for now, and because you don't want to watch me type um, boring stuff, we'll leave it at that. Um, most R scripts don't even have this much, so even having this is a, is a big improvement over a lot of the code that I've, I've written and that I've seen in others. So a lot of the coding that we're going to do is going to make use of uh, various packages from the tidyverse. We can import that by using library tidyverse, which is a meta package that contains uh, a bunch of other packages. Things like dplyr, ggplot, lubridate, forcats, uh, readr, things like that. And if you're not sure whether or not you have tidyverse installed, you can come down to the packages tab in the lower right corner and type tidyverse. You should see it there. Uh, do not click that box. I'll explain why in a second. And if you don't have it there, then you can come in here and type tidyverse. Okay. I already have it installed. Oh. I already have it installed, so I'm not going to worry about doing that. The reason I don't like to do that checkbox is because um, I want to be able to run my analysis.r script anywhere, whether I'm in RStudio or I'm running it from the command line. And so if I click this, then it's going to run library. So I'll do it here. It'll run library, um, and it runs that. right? So it's loaded, but um, if I run this R script somewhere else, and I don't have this line, if they don't have that line and I run this R script, it's probably going to complain because it doesn't know what dplyr is. And so um, that's why I don't like to have that checked. Instead, I like to put my library function calls inside of my individual R scripts. I also like to leave those at the top of the files so that if you come along, it's clear to you what files, what um, packages, I'm sorry, need to be installed to run the code. So we'll start with library tidyverse and we'll see that it installs packages ggplot, tibble, deep tidier, uh, readr, per, dplyr, stringer, and four cats. Okay. It also comes with a number of other um, packages um, that are installed but aren't quite loaded. And so one of those that we'll see is um, the package lubridate. Okay. Very good. So the first thing we're going to want to do is create a variable, an object called game data, which is going to be um, read um, underscore CSV file equals. And the great thing about the read R functions, like read CSV and all the read functions really from R, is that this doesn't have to be a physical file on my computer. It can actually be an HTML file. So I'm going to go back uh, to my issue tracker and I'm going to copy this HTML file name um, what are we doing too many tabs open and insert that here in um, the path for my file and so since I've got my cursor on this line, I can hit Command Enter, and that will automatically run it over here in the console. It takes a couple seconds to load up here, but once it does, we see that it's um, read in the file, it's parsed it to put in um, different uh, formats. Um, sometimes when I've done this in the past, it hasn't always correctly formatted those columns the way I'd want them. We can get another sense. If we do game data 
And then we can see the different columns, the data that's in here. This looks like that CSV file we were looking at on the um, website, but it's formatted a little bit nicer. Uh, so when you output a tibble, a data frame from the tidyverse, um, it limits the width of the table that's shown. And so it'll show you know as, as many as it can across the width here. And then it copies over and says there's 12 more variables that it couldn't include. And it tells you how it's being stored. So because I want to be a little bit defensive, I'm going to tell read CSV what exactly I want um, the, the f I'm sorry, what I want the columns to be read in as. And so we'll do call types, calls, and then I'm going to say date equals call date. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm not going to do all um, 26 columns. I'm only going to do the columns that I'm really concerned about because I know I'm going to use them as I go along. So season equals int, I'm sorry, call integer. Um, and rating one post is going to be call double. Rating two post equals call double. And then we're going to want our score one is the uh, call integer. And score two is call integer as well. Okay. And so um, one is for the home team, and two is for the visiting team. And so um, for some reason, unmatched open bracket. Ah, so I need to finish this with a closing bracket. And I'm going to go ahead and run this. Grab some coffee. And if we look at game data, we see um, that, again, things are formatted correctly. They've been parsed as we've specified. One of the things that um, I don't want in here is that there's a lot of games in here that haven't been played yet, that don't have um, the scores. right? So if I do game data. Um, select date um, score one score two uh, there's a lot of games in here that don't have scores because they haven't been played yet so I'd like to filter this to filter where date is less than the current date so I don't want today's games I want the games that were played before today and so I could go ahead and say current date is 2018-07-16. But if I run this on Sunday, I'm going to have to open this file and edit it. Um, we can make use of a looper date function, which is um, now. Let me just double check that. Uh, give you the Ah. So running the now function within Luberdate will give us today's date. And so we can say current date equals now. I guess I could have just put now in down here, but I want to make it I don't know, a little bit more specific. And so we can run this. And I can do game data select date score one score two. And we see that we have all of the games that have already been played, going back to July 15th, all the way back to, what was it, May 4th, 1871. So this now gives us our game data data frame that we can use for all of our subsequent analysis. And so with this, I'm going to save that. I'm going to go to my terminal, and I'm going to do a git add um, uh, analysis.r, git status, git commit, dash m, and I'm going to say load and um, process, or load and format um, game data. So now I can go forward, and if I screw anything up, because I'm using version control, I can always come back to this commit and have a clean slate going forward. I can also now come back into here, and I can now check off 
uh, this first item on my uh, to-do list. So the next thing I want to do is ascertain who the favorite was for each game and whether that favorite team won. To do this, I'm going to create a new object called favorite win prob. And we're going to have many ways to figure out who the favorite was. Uh, so today we're going to use the 538 model. Tomorrow we're going to use the win loss percentage. And then eventually we'll get to the betting line to determine who the favorite was. So based on the ELO scores, the favorite win prob, we can um, get this from game data. And we're going to pipe that into a mutate command where we will then say fav 538 one, and we'll also have a fav 538 prob. And so we need to add code in here now to fill that column for 538 one. And so I'm gonna use an if else statement. So if else um, rating one post greater than rating uh, two post. So if team one had the higher probability uh, sorry, this should be rating. I don't want the rating one post, do I? Is that what I want? Sorry, that should be um, rating prob one. And rating prob two. So the rating post was the actual rating score. So this is the probability that I actually want. So I want the rating one, rating prob one, rating prob two. And I'm a bit worried now <laughs> that I've got the wrong one. So I'm gonna run that and then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have it print out game data and I want to make sure rating prob one, rating prob two, rating prob one, rating prob two, rating prob one, rating prob two. Great. So if team one has the higher probability, then then um, then that team is the favorite. And so then we want to know did score one was that greater than score two? If rating two is actually higher than if probability two is higher than one, then it's the favorite. And so we then want to know does score two greater than score one? And again, for the um, probability, if else, rating prob one is greater than rating prob two. So then what is the fav what is it? so then team one is favored, what was its probability? Well that was rating prob one. And then if two was the favorite, what's its probability? Rating prob two. pipe right. So this now creates two columns on our game data. We're then going to run a select command where we will then do season, date, team1, team2, fave538, 1, fave538, prob, and then we'll do, um, that's it. And so we can run this, load this, and see what we get. That we get the season, the date, team one, team two, whether the favorite one and what the probability of them winning was, right? So on Sunday, the Cubs played the Padres. The Cubs were favored to win 65%. They actually then did in fact win. Um, we also see that Oakland, or somebody, I don't know who it was, maybe Oakland, was a favorite over the Giants. Um, just by a little bit, but they ended up the favorite team ended up losing. All right, so this takes care of our second task, which was to ascertain um, so ascertain the favorite. And we can check this off our list. 
And now we want to plot the fraction of games that the favorite has won over the history of baseball. And maybe I'll go ahead and add some comments in here to say um, load and format baseball games that have already been played. And ascertain Excellent. And so now what we want to do is we want to plot the um, fraction of games that the favorite get rid of that environment tab. I never really use that anyway. Um, and so we're going to build a plot where on the x-axis is the season, the y-axis is the fraction of games that the favorite won during that season to see whether or not the model's performance has varied over time. And so we will do favorite win prob and we're going to pipe that then into a group by season. So that way then we'll take the big data frame uh, favorite win prob and we'll then chunk it according to season. We will then do a summarize and we will save um, fraction favorite one is the mean of the fav 538 one column. Oh, 538. So the uh, 5381 is a, a logical column, so it's trues and falses. In R, true has a value of 1, false has a value of 0. If you have a vector, or say 10 trues and falses, the mean will tell you the fraction of those 10 that are true. Alternatively, if you do sum over the length of that vector, it will tell you how many things in that vector were true. So this is a cute way to very easily calculate the fraction of games at the favorite one. We'll then pipe that summarize into ggplot and we'll say AES, they are aesthetic, so our X is season, our Y is fraction favorite one, and we will then do geom line. And for now, let's see what, what we get. Uh, mapping must be created by AES. Oh, I always do that. I, f for some reason, use pipes instead of a plus sign. Run that, and we get uh, the trajectory of the fraction of games at the favorite one over the course of the last you know, 130 years of baseball. So it shows us what we want to see. Um, I'd like to gussy this up a bit and make it look a little bit more presentable. I'm not a big fan of uh, the default background, and I am would like to have a, a 0 to 1 scale on my y-axis. I would also like to put a line across indicating the average over all games of the number of um, the fraction of games that the favorite has won over the entire history of baseball. Um, this will allow us to see, you know, is it falling off here or is it relatively constant with time? So um, we'll start that. Um, by coming back up, and I want to define an overall win prob variable, and I will take um, favorite win prob and do a um, I, will, I will say that that is the mean of favorite win prob dollar sign uh, fav five thirty eight one. And I can then run this and see that the average is about 57.5% of the time the favorite does, in fact, win their game. And so I can then do geom um, h line y intercept equals overall win prob. 
And I'm going to have to wrap this in an aesthetic. Ah. Okay, I didn't need to have that equal sign in there. And so here we see our horizontal line at about 57.5. I'm going to add um, theme classic. This gives it then a white background. I also want to add um, a chord Cartesian, and we'll do Y limb uh, from zero to one. And so now we go from zero to one. Uh, this H line is kind of dark. I'm going to make its color, uh, I'll say light gray. And you can kind of see that that line is light. But if you look closely, you'll see it's on top of the line. So I can reverse the order to put the geom h line line of code before the geom line. And now um, it's reversed the ordering. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. Let me add some labels. So we'll do labs um, x equals um, season, y equals fraction of games, favorite one. And I'd like to also give it a title. And so I'll say something like uh, the 538 model does a better than average job of predicting the winner of baseball games. I need to put this in quotes. And I'll do a subtitle. And I'm going to do a something like um, since 1871 the favorite has won percent of their games and so I can use a paste function in here to uh, concatenate together um, various strings and so I will so I need to then insert in here um, round um, 100 times overall win prob and then we'll do digits equals one this should work great uh, so see I'm missing a space here after the one and that looks pretty nice one of the things that I do kind of see is that after about the 1950s the model doesn't do as well as it did before the 1950s and so perhaps it would be good to retrain the model using data from the more modern seasons. Um, baseball's gone through various um, iterations in its history, whether it's the, whether the ball was more lively or not, or the height of the mound, whether it was during an expansion period. Um, more recently, the American League and National League have actually been playing each other, whereas before about 2000 or so, they never played each other. Um, so it's had a lot of iterations, and so you can imagine that the model to predict win winners and losers might change over that history. So this is great. Um, this shows us how the model performs in predicting winners and losers um, over the course of its history. I would say it's better than average, it's better than flipping a coin, um, but not much. And so I suspect that baseball is really random, um, or has a high likelihood towards uh, seeming random, because... Um, just because teams are perhaps very similar to each other and the margin of difference between the teams is, is quite small. So I'm going to go ahead and commit this. And say, um, what? Uh, generate plot. Showing change in performance over time. Excellent. And we'll go ahead and check this off our to-do list. So the final thing I'd like to do today is to determine whether the probabilities generated by the model actually bear out with the real baseball data. So as we've seen that you know predicting a baseball game who's going to win and lose can be pretty hard. Um, and so it gives us, you know, a, a saying who the favorite is, is, is a like, dichotomous variable. You know, are they the favorite or not? But what things like the ELO model give us 
and betting line and other models is a probabilistic function, right? It's like saying Clinton was the 70 or 80 percent favorite to win the 2016 election. Well, like, I was, like I've been saying, we can't run that election, thank goodness, <laughs> a thousand times to see if she wins 70 percent of the time to validate that model. What we'd like to do is to say, okay, predicting winners and losers is hard, but when we give a probability of a win or loss, does that, is that probability based in reality or is it just a random number? And so what we'd like to do is to plot um, the fraction of games that were won uh, by the favored team when they're favored at a specific um, probability. And we would expect those to fall on like a 45 degree line with an intercept of zero and say a slope of one. So we're gonna do some a little bit more advanced R work now to go in and, and figure that out. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, to plot the um, observed versus expected um, fraction of games won by the favorite. And again, for this, we're going to use all of the data going back to 1871. Again, you could use the filter um, function to focus in on specific periods of baseball history. So you maybe only want to do 2018 or everything since 2015, um, or maybe you just wanted to look at the year 2017. For what we're going to do, we're going to look at the full history of baseball. And I'm going to add some space here just to move everything up. And so we're going to work with the favorite win prob uh, data frame. And I'm going to pipe that to a mutate function where I will then say um, I'm going to take, um, if, I, if I look at this, if we look at favorite win prob, you'll see that the probabilities here go out to the thousandth place. To, to build up the numbers that I have, I'm gonna only go to the hundredth spot. So I'm gonna round all of these probabilities to the hundredth. So it'll be 65, 51, 65, 55. And then I'm gonna aggregate within those and figure out the fraction of games that were won within those bins. Okay, so I'm gonna first mutate um, five, fave, uh, 538prob to be a round and we're going to round fave 538 prob, and we'll say digits equals two. And to make sure that works, we now run that, and we see that we have, in fact, um, rounded it to two digits. I'm gonna then group by fave 538 prob, and then within that, we're going to summarize and we're gonna say n for the number of games played. Um, I'm gonna call it games, sorry. And to get that, we'll use the n function. We will then get wins, which will be the sum of um, fave 538.1. And then we'll have avg, I'm sorry, observed, which will be wins divided by games. We run that, and we see that for um, let me shrink this down a bit, um, and let me run that again, and I'm gonna pipe this to a print uh, where n equals inf, and we get the entire tibble here, and we see the probability of winning the game, the number of games that have been played within, that have had that probability since 1871, the number of wins, and then the observed frequency, right? So um, for games that had a 63% probability, um, actually the teams that had that that were favored won 65% of the time. And so it looks like these numbers are a little bit hot, right? That the observed is actually a little bit higher than you would predict. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. So let's see what this looks like. And also, um, you know, when you flip a coin, say, um, say we flip a coin 9,984 9, times, um, what do we expect to see for the number of heads? Do we expect to see um, 5,000? Or is 4886 
outside of what we'd expect just based on uh, random variation. So what I want to do is I want to have a plot where on the x-axis is the, um, the predicted frequency of wins and losses, the predicted probability, and the y-axis is going to be the observed, and I'm going to have a line that has a slope of 1, an intercept of 0, and um, around that I want the confidence interval for what I would reasonably expect given the number of games that were played, and on top of that I want to then plot what I actually observed to see whether the observed falls within that cloud around that line. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, what I'm what I'm going for here and so to do that we're gonna use a binomial model to fit the data and so I need to save this as a variable and I'm gonna call this all predicted observed and run that to store that into um, memory and that looks right and so now we're going to work with this to do binomial fit validation and we're going to take the all predicted observed and we're going to pipe that um, into a group by and we're going to group that by the fave 538 uh, prob and within that we're going to then nest the data and if we look at this uh, for now I'm going to maybe bring this down to its own line. Okay, it doesn't like me doing that. I'm going to remove this for now, or just comment it out. We see that we get the probabilities that we had here, and it's converted each line into games wins observed. And it's converted that into its own tibble. So what I want to do is for each of these probabilities, to take the gin, g games, wins, and observed, really just the games and wins, and to calculate what is the 95% conf 95 confidence interval that I would expect in the number of wins. Okay, And so we're going to use the map function, we're going to use the broom function, um, and the tidy function, uh, sorry, the tidy function from the broom package to make that all work. So one of the problems with this, though, or, or let me get to the problem. We'll see the problem here pretty soon. So with the nest function, we can then say mutate, and I'll say binomial. So we'll create a new column, which is really going to be its own data frame, a column of data frames, where we have binomial equals map. And the input um, from um, this pipeline in dplyr into mutate, the default value is data. That's what it's called uh, by default. And then we'll say function df. And so the data frame is what um, map is pulling off of data for each row that it's going through of the data frame, so df. And this is going to be an anonymous function where we then say, um, I'm going to do some indents in here just to make it clear where things go. We say tidy, and we'll do binome.test. And we will then say x equals um, I'm just going to pseudocode this number of wins and um, n equals number of games. Okay. And get my parentheses right. Yeah. So, so if we look at binome test, we see that this is a function that performs an exact test of simple null hypothesis about the probability of success in a Bernoulli experiment, where x is the number of successes, n is the number of trials. Right? So if I were to do binome.test and um, say, let's, let's say um, 3, 5, so the probability of winning 3 out of 5 games, um, what is the um, I guess the p is going to be 0.6, that we then see that our probability of success is 0.6, and the 95% confidence interval is 0.14 to 0.95. Okay. So this is essentially what we want to do, but for all of the rows in our all-predicted observed data frame. And so 
the number of games, n, is going to be our games column. And, I'm um, sorry, but it's going to be df dollar sign games because we're giving this function df. And here we want df dollar sign number of games, but we also want it times df dollar sign prob. But we don't have a prob <laughs> probability um, in here. We've got it outside, right? So if we, if we look at this data frame as it's coming into the mutate, we've got the probability on the outside. On the inside, it's the um, number of games, the number of wins, and the observed probability. Um, we want to know, we need that probability in there. So I don't really know how to look outside of the tibble to another column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a column that is basically going to copy, it's going to be prob equals fav 538 prob. And so this is going to copy um, that, that column, 538 prob, to now be a new column within my tibble. And so if we look at this, we should now see yeah, Fav 538 prob. Hmm. Oh, missing my pipe. If so I run that, I now see I have one by four, right? So we've added prob and we've nested all, of, we've nested this within 0.5, okay? And so what we're doing again is we're mutating um, by adding a column binomial. We're running the binome test to get that out. This tidy function that we wrap around binome test takes the output of, um, so takes this output and it turns it into data for a data frame. Okay, and so let's see what that looks like. The output then is going to be, uh, cannot find function tidy. So this is coming from the broom package. So we need to say library broom. And so now we try this. X must be an integer and non-negative. Ah, so the problem is that df games times df prob is going to be a fraction. And so what I want to do is I need to make this an integer. So we can say as integer. And the other thing that occurred to me is that we need to add p equals df dollar sign prob. So if we run this now, we now see we have that probability, the data tibble, as well as our binomial um, uh, column from our data frame. And we can now do um, unnest, run that, and that unnesting then opens up those data frames so that we can then see the 538 probability, um, these four columns coming from uh, that data column when we did the nesting, and these columns then being the output from um, uh, running the, the binomial test. And so we can then come back here and do select. I guess it's not essential, but it makes me feel better about life to have things uh, kind of comp compact a little bit. Uh, 538 prob, games, wins, um, we'll then do observed, and then we'll also do conf.low and conf.high. Yeah, high. Okay, and so now we have, for all of our probabilities, we have what we observed, and then the low and the high confidence interval. Great. So now we want to plot this, of course. And I'm going to come back here and save this as this data frame. I, I generally don't. I generally like to work it like this, um, just because it allows me to see the output at each step as I go through, and then to be sure to come back and to save it as a new data frame for input to other functions, other pipelines, and making plots. So I can take this now and I can pipe that into ggplot. where I'm going to do AES, and my X is going to be um, the fave 538 prob, Y is going to be observed, and um, I can then, uh, plus, <laughs> I did that again, uh, geom uh, point, and if I run this, what does it look like? We see a pretty good line here, um, and it's not quite 
um, as we saw with looking at the table, I believe it's um, it's a little bit above a 90 degree line or 45 degree line. So we can then add a b line, um, and we'll say uh, y intercept or say intercept. Oh, sorry, it's going to be a s intercept equals zero, slope equals one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it needs to be geom AB line. So that's our 45 degree line. And we see that our points do largely fall above that line. I can then also add geom ribbon. And I forget the syntax for geom ribbon. So by my desk here, I have this stack of cheat sheets. And so I'm going to get my ggplot cheat sheet. Um, and I know it's called geom ribbon, but I forget the actual syntax for what it wants for AES. So it wants y min and y max. Great. So we'll do AES y min equals conf dot low y max equals conf dot high. If we run this, keep hitting that T. We get this ugly mess. <laughs> um, and so um, our ribbon is black, filled with black basically, um, and it's on top of everything else. So let's move these AB lines and ribbon above uh, geom point, add our plus sign. Um, I'm going to put my line in front of my ribbon. I'm going to do color equals light. gray uh, and if you look closely you notice that the border to the ribbon is light gray and it's not color I want it's fill so that looks good um, maybe I'll make my color for this uh, dark gray okay so that looks a little bit more subtle and puts more emphasis on our actual observed points and again I'm not a big fan of the default styling, so we'll do um, um, theme classic. And I'm going to do um, uh, chord Cartesian Y limb from Z0 to 1. See how this looks. And so that looks pretty slick, right? We need to change our, our labels, but we see that that the 538 model seems to be a bit conservative. That if we say that a team has a 70% chance of winning, they actually have a higher percent chance of winning than it's indicating um, in, in this, according to this model, okay? According to reality, right? Um, and so that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, the other thing that we, we saw from before is that, um, that most of the games are actually in this range in here. So where most of the games occur, it's probably doing a pretty good job, um, and, and you really can't tell much of a difference. Um, whereas where we have fewer games, um, it starts to tilt above um, the, the predicted probability. All right, so finishing this up, we can do labs x equals um, predicted probability of winning, uh, y equals observed probability of winning. And we can then say um, main, and we'll say the 538 model under predicts the true ability of the favorite to win. And the subtitle, we'll say all games from 1871 to present. Great. Oh, some. Oh, I think this should be title. I'm a I'm a recovering base R user, and so I get some of the syntax swapped between base and ggplot. Excellent. And so that looks really nice, and it makes the point I think pretty nicely that that again 538 is under predicting the true ability of the favorites to win. So we will finish up here by going into our terminal. 
Oh, I need to save my analysis.r file. We'll git add, git commit, and we will then say compare modeled to predicted win fraction. No, oh, sorry, modeled to observed. And then we'll say closes number one. So this is finishes our branch closing out issue one. If we then come back to our issue tracker, we can click that off. And then I can do git checkout master. Yep. So now it's upset. Don't to close this file now. No. Um, we can then do git merge. 538 validation. And so this is taking all the data from all the code from 538 validation and now merging it that into uh, the master. Oh. So everything is good. Our branch is ahead of origin master by four commits. We can do git push. And this is now pushing our data, our code, up to GitHub. And I can hit refresh here. And we see that um, because I added that closes number one, it then adds in um, that it closed this issue just now. And if we look back at our code, we now see that we've got our analysis.r file in here as well. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the first demo. Uh, some of the things that we're going to go forward with uh, in the next demo is to add a new model based on the team's actual win-loss records to that point of the season. Um, we also haven't added uh, any way to store graphs in here. Uh, we also don't really have great structure, but eh, I'm not so worried about that right now. Um, and I hope I know this has gone a little bit long, but I really hope you've enjoyed uh, seeing this demo of how I work with R and the various tidyverse packages to um, make some inferences and to see if we can validate the 538 models um, and other models that are out there and try to improve upon them. And I think what we saw was actually that the 538 baseball model ELO model does a pretty good job of predicting uh, winners and losers. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. So I'll see you tomorrow and um, enjoy the baseball, uh, the all-star game tonight.